الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is our second lesson on the fiqh of family fiqh al-usra The points that we're going to be going over today are 10 points Today's class is going to be about 10 points inshallah ta'ala the first one is ma yustahabbu fi'luhu idha dakhala ala zawjatihi what is recommended to be done what is recommended to be done when one first goes to his wife The first night, what is one meant to do? We'll talk about that, inshallah. Number two, wujubul walima, the obligation of the wedding feast. The obligation of a wedding feast. Number three. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ لِمَنْ حَضَرَ الدَّعْوَةَ أَمْرَانَ It is recommended for the guests to abide by the two following issues. The people, the guests who are invited at the wedding, they need to abide by two issues. It is recommended for the guest to abide by the following two issues. Number four. Kam yankihul hurru. How many women can a free man marry? How many women can a free man marry? Number five. المحرمات من النساء المحرمات من النساء women that one is prohibited to marry women that one is prohibited from marrying the sixth الرضاع الذي يثبت به التحريم The breastfeeding that makes one ineligible for marriage The breastfeeding that makes one ineligible for marriage Number seven المحرمات مؤقتا Women that one is temporarily forbidden to marry Women that one is temporarily forbidden to marry Number eight الْأَنْكِحَةُ الْفَاسِدَةِ Void marriages Void marriages Void marriages Number nine الْحُقُوقُ الزَّوْجِيَّةِ The rights of spouses The rights of spouses and in there, point number nine, the rights of spouses, in this point, I'm going to tackle it from two. The first one is Hakul Marati ala Rajuli. The rights of the woman upon the husband. And I'll start with that. 
And then haqqul rajuli ala al-mar'ah The rights of the husband upon his wife Those two they fall under point number nine And the tenth and final point that we will discuss today inshallah ta'ala is Al-khilafat al-zawjiyah Al-khilafat al-zawjiyah Marital disputes Marital disputes Al-khilafat al-zawjiyah Marital disputes and argumentations and discord the way that I plan to speak about this one is in three points. The marital disputes, I plan to go over it in three points, inshallah ta'ala. The first one is Curing. First one is, this is the marital dispute between the couples. I'm going to speak about three points from there. Number one is عِلَاجُ نُشُوزِ الْمَرْأَةِ Curing I'm solving improper behavior inappropriate behavior on the part of the woman. Improper solving improper behavior on the part of the woman the problem is coming from the woman she's coming with improper improper behavior the second one is improper solving and curing improper behavior on the part of the husband the man that's the second and the third one is and the final point for today is What should be done if the discord, the disputes, the differences between the spouses grows stronger? If it becomes severe, what should be done? What should be done? If the discord between the spouses grows stronger and they have big differences, how do they solve it? That's today, inshallah ta'ala. Today's class, inshallah ta'ala, on the fiqh of family. Is everybody excited about the topics? Is everybody excited? Ah. Point number one. The first point was what is recommended to be done when one first goes to his wife. What is recommended is It is recommended for the husband to be very kind to his wife. That is kind, soft, tender. And what is what specifically should he do that first night? He brings forward, he gives to her something to drink. The man gives the woman something to drink. And this is based upon the hadith of Asma bint Yazid. This is based upon the hadith of who? Asma bint Yazid. She said, Inni qayyantu she said, I beautified. I beautified Aisha for the Messenger. I beautified her. Then I came to him. When, he, when she beautified Aisha and she made her look good, Asma bint Yazid, she went to the Prophet. She said, Aisha is now ready. I had got her ready for you. I prepared her for you. Go to her, O Messenger of Allah. The Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he entered onto Aisha and he came in and he sat right next to her. فَجَاءَ فَجَلَسَ إِلَى جَنْبِهَا فَأُوتِيَ بِعُسٍ لَبَنٍ 
And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given a large cup of milk. And so he drank from it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he gave it to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Aisha was very shy. So her head went down and she was very shy. Asma bint Yazid is watching this. She said to her, stop what you're doing. Meaning don't be like that. Take the cup from the Prophet. Take it from her. Take it from him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she took it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she drank from it. So this is the first thing that the Prophet did with his wife. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Second thing that the person should do is أَنْ يَضْعَ يَدَهُ He should place his hand على مقدمة رأسها The beginning of her head in two ways. He can either put his hand on her, the forehead or he can grab her hair, a bit of her hair. And what he does when he does that is he asks Allah to de descend on him and bring down on him barakah. And this is based on the hadith that إِذَا تَزَوَّجَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِمْرَأَةٌ If one of you marries a woman أو اشترى خادما or he buys a slave فَلْيَأْخُذْ بِنَاصِيَتِهَا Grab the forehead of the wife وَلْيُسَمِّ اللَّهَ And say بِسْمِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَدْعُ بِالْبَرَكَةِ And beg Allah and ask him to send barakah on you. And this is what you say. اللهم إني أسألك أو الله I ask you من خيرها the good that is in this woman and the good that is in this situation وخير ما جلبتها عليه and I ask you أو الله I ask you for her good and the good of what you have placed in front of me وأعوذ بك أو الله I seek refuge in you من شرها the evil in and the evil that can come from this. This is the dua that the person makes. And it's recommended, third thing, it's recommended that they pray two rak'ah together. That they pray two rak'ah together. This is based upon two evidences it's based on two evidences the first one is the evidence of Abi Sa'id Mawla Abi Usaidin and the second one is the story of Shaqiq both of those evidences prove that the person should what? should pray two rak'ah with their partner and the evidence shows that the woman's at the back and the man's at the front Never does the man and the woman pray next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. She will be in the back. And he prays two rak'ah with her. This is before they come into contact with each other. Now if they have an intimate relationship, the man should say, Bismillah in the name of Allah. Allahumma jannibna shaytana wa jannib shaytana ma razaqtana. Oh Allah, Distance shaitan from us and also distance shaitan from our offspring. The messenger said, فَإِنْ قُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمَا This intimate relationship that they had, if a child comes out of it, وَلَدٌ A child, لَمْ يَضُرُّهُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَبَدًا Shaitan will not harm them ever. This is the prophetic guidance. You see, at the early stage in Islam, you're starting off your family correctly. You're putting everything in what? In the right direction. From the woman that you chose. From the first night. You don't just jump on the woman. You take these protocols. You do these steps. These steps are there to what? To bring out khair and blessings for us. You make dua, you supplicate. So this is what you say. If Allah gives you a child from this, shaitan will not 
come into contact with that child. The intimate relationship that the wife and the husband have, the Sharia has also spoken about it. The man has to have intimacy with the wife from the front, not from the back passage. Allah said in the ayah, Nisa'ukum harthul lakum fa'tu harthakum anna shi'tum. That your wives, your spouses, are a tilt for you. So go to your tilt when or how you will. What is the context of the ayah and how did the ayah come down? The ayah came down as Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned. Kana til yahudu yaqulu. The Jews, before Islam, they used to say, If a man has intimate relationship with his wife, If he has intimate relationship from the front but from the back, The child will be cross-eyed. They used to say the child will be what? Cross-eyed. فَنَزَلَتْ this ayah came down. Your wives are your tilth. And here what it means is, as long as the intimate penetration and the intimate relationship is happening from the front, whatever direction is not a problem. Abdullah ibn Abbas also mentioned another story. Or another sabab nuzul, which is both of them are the same. He said, كَانَ هَذَا الْحَيُّ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ The people of Ansar, who were they neighbors with? Three tribes of Jews, right? Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa' and Banu... Banu Quraidha. Those are the three tribes of the Qur uh, Yahud. The Jews, they believe this concept. That if the man has intimate relationship with his wife from the front passage, but she's not on her back. They used to believe that this will affect the child's eyes. The child will be cross-eyed. This, this was their belief. Ansar were idol worshippers. They, they didn't have no scripture. So they looked up to who? So they looked up to the Jews. And so they took this from the Jews. They took it from them. And so when they took it from the Jews, an um, muhajir who came from Mecca, had married an Ansari woman and he had intimate relationship with her with her not lying on her back and so then she said to him get away from me this is evil what you're trying to do and so the issue reached the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this ayah came down nisa'ukum harthu lakum fa'tu harthakum anna shi'tum the man is not allowed to have intimate relationship in the wife in two situations one he's not allowed to have intimate relationship with her while she's on her menstruation he's not allowed to and he's not also allowed to have intimate relationship from her back passage the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said man ata anyone who has sexual intercourse with his wife while she's on her menstruation aw imra'atan fi duburiha or he comes and has intimate relationship with her from her back passage. O kahinan. Or he goes to a fortune teller. Subhanallah. It's mentioned in the context of a fortune teller. Fasaddaqahu. And he believes the fortune teller. Bima yaqulu what he says. Faqad kafara bima unzil ala Muhammadin. He has disbelieved in that which has been sent on Nabi Lahi Muhammad. Disbelieved. Again, it doesn't mean kufur akbar. It means what? Minor kufr. So it's very dangerous. It is what? It's very dangerous. If a man has intimate relationship with his wife with the intention of getting closer to Allah by it, or he's doing it because he wants to be chast. Chast mean he wants to be afif. Oh Allah, I don't want to do haram. Here I am. I got married. I'm doing it in a halal way. He does it with that intention. He will be rewarded for it. He will be rewarded for, the, for it. And it will be considered a sadaqah. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, in the hadith of Abi Dhar, and the nasa min ashabi nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a group of the companions of the Messenger, 
قالوا للنبي they said to the prophet يا رسول الله يا مسجد الله ذهب أهل الدثور بالأجور the rich people they have taken all of the reward يصلون كما نصلي they pray with us just like we pray they pray ويصومون كما نصوم and they fast the way that we fast ويتصدقون بفضول أموالهم but they have an additional thing that we don't have they have money to spend they give out their money then the messenger said to them أوليس قد جعل الله لكم has Allah not given you ما تصدقون صدقة that you can give there's a sadaqa that you guys can give as well what is it إن بكل تصبيحة صدقة every subhanallah there is a sadaqa وبكل تكبيرة صدقة every Allah Akbar there's a sadaqa in it وبكل تهليلة صدقة every time you say لا إله إلا الله there's a sadaqa وبكل تحميدة صدقة every time you say الحمد لله there's a sadaqa وأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر صدقة calling to the good and enjoining the good and forbidding the evil is a sadaqa as well وفي بضع أحدكم صدقة and even in the intimate relationship that you have with your spouses it's a sadaqa so the sahabas were caught off guard they weren't expecting that قالوا يا رسول الله they said oh messenger of Allah أيأتي أحدنا does one of us come with شهوته does one of us fulfill his desires ويكون له فيها أجر and he gets reward for it قال the messenger said أرأيتم do you not see لو وضعها في حرام what about if he was to fulfill his desires in haram and he was to do zina أكان عليه وزر will he not get a sin for it will he not get a sin for it sahaba said of course then the messenger said فَكَذَلِكَ إِذَا وَضَعَهَ فِي الْحَلَالِ The same is if he was to do it in halal, there has to be reward for it. إِذَا وَضَعَهَ فِي الْحَلَالِ كَانَ لَهُ أَجْرٌ He gets a reward for this. This is called قِيَاسُ الْعَكْسِ The messenger used evidence to its opposite. He used the opposite as an evidence. So the intimate relationship that you have with your spouse, if you come with the right intention, you can get rewarded for it. It's a ibadah. It can become an ibadah. That's why in the English language, the, the word ibadah, saying worship, is very weak. Because the English language, they cannot fathom that having an intimate relationship with your spouse is a worship. What are you talking about? But for us, the term ibadah is a broad term. It's a general term. Are we all together? That's why it's weak to use the word Worship, because worship is only restricted to what? When you enter the church. Or when you enter the place of ibadah, or the place you want to worship. Like if for us, ibadah could be every day of your dealings with your family. The Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, alayhi salatu salam, about if a man takes a spoon and a food, and he places it, hatta ma taj'alu fi fayy mra'atin. You take a spoon and you put it in your wife's mouth. You can get rewarded for that. And it's amazing because shaitan, subhanAllah, works in different ways. You might provide for your wife and you might give her mon money every month, which you should do as a man. And you provide for your family, but you don't get rewarded for it because you didn't come with the what? With the intention. He will make you forget to come with the intention. You could get rewarded for providing for your own children and your wife and your family members and your parents if you just come with the intention are we all together intentions are very important and this teaches us something very important about Islam is that the Muslim is always conscious about all of his actions his surroundings the, all, the Muslim is always alert he's not heedless he's not a ghafil absent-minded that's very important we now move on to the second point, which is wujubul walima. Walima is obligatory. The obligation of a wedding feast. Some of you might ask, and you might wonder to yourself, why would you be mentioning the wedding after you spoke about intimate relationship and the partners are together already? The wedding should have been mentioned early. Huh? No, not necessarily. The walima is done بعدد دخول after the nikah is done the walima is done when 
بعد النكاح اما بعد الدخول after the man has entered onto the onto the woman that's when it's actually done عبد الرحمن بن عوف رضي الله تعالى عنه رضي الله تعالى عنه he did his walima after he entered onto her or after he the nikah was done you know you have to understand the nikah is what is what makes it lawful for the wife and the husband to interact to meet one another to have a relationship that's the nikah the nikah it's the legal, it's the contract the walima is done after burayd ibn al husayb he said lamma khatab ali ibn fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha when ali got married to fatima and the the sermon was done the messenger said alayhi salatu wasalam innahu la budda lil ursi min walima the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said a wedding must have a it must have a wedding feast the nikah there has to be a feast something has to be done the prophet said la budda what about abdul rahman auf the prophet said oh lim walaw shat he commanded he said do a walima that's an amr from the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam so some scholars they took from that that it's obligatory These are the following things that need to be observed in the wedding feast. These are the things that need to be observed and they need to be looked at. Okay? Number one. أَن تَكُونَ ثَلَاثَةُ أَيَّامٍ عَقِبَ الدُّخُولِ It should be done three days after. Three days. The wedding feast should be for three days after الدُّخُول after they the consummation is done after the consummation is done three days because this is what is being transmitted from the messenger alayhi salatu salam in the sunnah the hadith of Anas ibn Malik and he said tazawwaj al the messenger got married Safiya he married what? Safiya wa ja'ala itqaha sadaqaha and the messenger sallallahu alayhi salam Safiya remember she was taken as a captive and so when the messenger married her the dowry was her being freed. That was her dowry. وَجَعَلَ الْوَلِيمَةَ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ And the walim was done when? Three days. After the consummation. Number two. The second thing that needs to be observed. Okay, of course, it doesn't have to be three days. It can be the same time. No problem. It's not an obligatory. The three days is not obligatory. It's just that the wedding feast needs to be done. But the sunnah what is recommended and should be done is like this number two and yet was salihina ilayha fuqara fuqara and kanu or agnia the second thing is the righteous people should be invited to the walima to the wedding feast the righteous people should be invited to it whether they are rich or poor doesn't matter they should be righteous people and this is based on the hadith of the prophet where he said la, la tu sahib illa mu'mina. the messenger said sallallahu alayhi wasallam do not be companions and do not be a friend except with righteous people be friend righteous people and do not let your food be eaten illa taqiyun except a righteous person don't let um, your food um, don't let anyone eat your food except a righteous person a pious person so your wedding only invite the righteous people don't call gangsters and thugs and criminals and oh I used to know him in school he's my friend I know him he knows me we're best friends no this is your wedding call the righteous people and sometimes those righteous people can be rich no problem and they can be what poor stay away from making the wedding only for the poor the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said sharru ta'ami the evilest the worst food is ta'amul walimati the wedding the food of the wedding feast yumna'uha man ya'tiha those who want to come are prevented from it وَيُدْعَى إِلَيْهَا مَنْ يَأْبَاهَا 
And the ones who don't want to come are being told to come. وَمَن لَمْ يُجِبِ الدَّعْوَةَ فَقَدْ عَصَى اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And anyone who doesn't obey the calling has disobeyed Allah and His Messenger. If you've got a valid reason why you, why you couldn't come, that's no problem. But if there's no reason for you, if you don't accept that call, you've disobeyed Allah and His Messenger. Are we all together? So, the re- what does it mean that the ones who want to come are being stopped? It's the poor. The poor are generally the ones who want to eat at the weddings. They don't have nothing to eat. And the rich, they're too busy. They don't want to eat. They don't want to waste their time. That's what the hadith means. Because another hadith explained it. So if someone calls you at the a wedding feast, a walima, go. And make sure that you participate there. We'll talk about exceptions and times that you shouldn't go. But other than that, generally you should go. The one, now we're going to move on to point number three. What is recommended for the guest to abide by when he comes to the wedding feast? Okay, what should you do? Two things. Two th- issues you need to observe. Two things you need to abide by. Number one, أَن يَدْعُوَ لِصَاحِبِهَا بَعْدَ الْفَرَاغِ بِمَا جَاءَ عَنْهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم You, after eating, after eating the food that was served, you should supplicate for the host. Supplicate for the host For the food that they gave you The food You should say Allahumma ghafil lahum Or Allah forgive them Warhamhum Have mercy upon them Wabarik lahum And place barakah on them Fi ma razaktahum In the rizq and the provision that they've given us Also you can say Allahumma at'im man at'amani Oh Allah Give sustenance to the one who has given us for sustenance and food Wasqi man saqadi And oh Allah Give fluid and water to the one who has given us water. You can also say, "Akala ta'amukum al abraru, wa sallat alaykum al malaika tu aftar indakum al saimun." Scholars they differ upon the authenticity of some of the narrations here, but these are some of it. Point number two. Point number two. When you come, what should you do? Ad du'a ilahu, am ad du'a ulahu. The first one was supplication for the food they gave you. Now you're making dua for them. Wali zawjihi. And he's, you make the dua for the man and his wife. Or if you're a sister, then you make dua for the sister and her husband. And we mentioned the dua that you say at the beginning when we were talking about the greeting of the nikah. We mentioned that in last lesson. Point as an, This is the exception in which you shouldn't go to the wedding you should not go to the wedding feast if it contains haram if there's ma'asiyah disobedience of Allah that's taking place there don't go and if you do go it has to be with the intention of trying to rectify the situation you're going there to forbid them from the evil and to enjoy the good if that is the purpose you're going there no problem but if there is bad things that are happening there Music, for instance, is being played that are haram, that has vulgar speech and whatnot, don't go. If there's free mixing, the opposite gender, male and women are free mixing, then also don't go. If there's dancing that's going to happen, don't go. And the people who are doing that, who are having their weddings, disobeying Allah Azza wa Jalla, remember one thing. This is how you have chosen to start the life between you and your partner. Halfway into your marriage Cry to Allah and they say Oh Allah, my situation, rectify it But remember the way you started it And the way you began your marriage This is the partner that you want to spend life with You want Allah to give you good children You want your children to carry on this legacy of Islam Make sure you don't disobey Allah Azza wa Jalla Don't disobey Allah Azza wa Jalla the evidence for not participating in these places is the, the evidence is as follows. Ali ibn Abi Talib he said, Sana'atu ta'aman, I made food. Fada'utu Rasulullah, I called the messenger. I invited him. Faja'a, the messenger came. 
Fara'a fil bayti, he saw in the house tasawir, pictures. What did he see? The messenger saw pictures, alayhi salatu salam. Faqultu, I said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, ma arja'aka bi abi anta wa ummi. This minute the messenger saw the pictures, he done a U-turn and he left. Ali came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I free my mother and my father. What is it that made you go back? What made you do a U-turn? What is it that made you do a U-turn? The messenger then said, Inna fil bayti sitra. There is a curtain in this house. Fihi tasawir, there are pictures in it. Wa inna al malaikata, the angels, la tadkhulu baytan fihi tasawir. The angels do not enter a house, there is a picture in. And this is very important, brothers and sisters. Pictures are prohibited in Islam. They are haram. And if you look at the religion, the first thing that Allah was disobeyed in was what? Two things. Two things. The, the whole of mankind, their deviation, and them astraying from the right path, was of two things. al ghulu fil afadil Going overboard in the righteous people. Exaggeration over the righteous people. And we have that today. People go overboard with people. You travel the world. People are going overboard. Either with religious figures. Ziyadat, Ghulu. Overboard. Or the Muslims are going overboard with non-Muslims. Celebrities, and artists, and rappers, and singers. Ghulu. You generally find it. And the messenger used to prohibit his sahabas from that. He would say to them, لا تطروني, Don't go overboard with me. كَمَا أَطْرَةِ النَّصَارَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ Like the Christians have gone overboard with who? Isa ibn Maryam. فَقُولِ when, when you speak about me, the Prophet said this, if you speak about me, and you're talking about me, فَقُولُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ Say the slave of Allah, and the messenger of Allah. Why did he choose those two words? Because he doesn't want you to take him out of عُبُودِيَة, servitude, and take him up to what level? Uluhiyah. And you say he's ilah. No, 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 no. I'm a slave. So he's, a, he's below Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then why did he say, I'm a messenger from Allah? So you don't think he's an ordinary slave. Like us. That's a, he's a higher than that. So he's lower than Allah and he's higher than us. That's the level he gives himself. And that is the station Allah gave him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first thing that the children of Adam went astray. The second reason was what? Pictures. It was pictures. And the five righteous men that were worshipped after Nabi Adam was what? وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَصْرًا Five men. Five righteous men, Ibn Abbas said. But what did their people do? They made a statue. And what did they do? What was their purpose behind the statue? What was the statue for brothers? They didn't make it at the beginning to worship. The first ones who did it, who carved the statues, they did not do it to worship. What was it? It is to remember them. They said we want to remember them. Isn't that not why you guys have your albums at home where you have your children's pictures? Your childhood pictures. I will remember how I looked when I was young. Isn't that not the answer? Isn't that the reason why you have it? So the first set of people who made these statues of these five righteous men, their reasoning was, we're just going to remember them. These are righteous men, noble men. We just want to remember them. That's what we want to do. And so they did it. They carved the, the statue. Shaitan said to those ones, yeah, that's why you want to do it. Those died. Then the next generation came. And then he whispered to them, put them in the masjid. And then third sage, worship them. And as time goes on, that's what's going to happen. So those are the two things that the first deviation in this ummah came from. Pictures and going overboard with the righteous people. 
And so the messenger fought against the concept of pictures. And according to my opinion, and I believe it's the strongest opinion, photographs are also haram. They fall under this. It's nothing to prove otherwise. Because the messenger used the word tasawir, pictures. So it's, it brings no benefit and it causes many sharr. Not to mention now women are taking pictures of themselves, they're flashing it on social media, they're showing their hair. This is even worse. It is what? Even worse. It's something that a Muslim should stay away from. Flashing your beauty, putting something out there for everyone to see. And some of these sisters, they start to wear niqab later, and they start to cover up later, and they get married, and they become a wife, and they have children, and they want that picture to go. Sorry. Someone out there has it. So on social media, there's not much you can do about it. So think about pictures. Pictures are something that lasts forever. Man. So the messenger didn't want to enter the house. So imagine a picture, the Prophet saw a curtain and it had a picture on it. And he said, I don't want to enter it. Remember, some of you might think, oh, but it was a statue. The five men, what they worshipped, it was a statue. We're talking about photograph. Then the Prophet left the house when there was a curtain that had a picture. He prohibited sallallahu alayhi wa There is something that is permissible for the women to do at the wedding. Two things. The women are allowed to use the duf. The duf, the women are allowed to use. The duf is a tambourine. They hit it, but it doesn't have no bangles. It doesn't have it. Just not, it's like a drum, but it doesn't have no... It's bangles. And the second one is their voices. They can sing. The women are allowed to sing. What they sing cannot cause evil between people. They can't be talking about tribal things which cause rivalry between people. Okay? It's not allowed. In other words, to ignite problems amongst the community. They're not, they're not allowed to do that. They're not, also, they're not also allowed to speak about vulgar and in, inappropriate things. Fudur. They're not allowed to say that. But if they're only praising, they can. They're praising the family of the boy, the family of the girl, no problem. Like in, they are not allowed to go overboard in the praise as well. They're not allowed to go overboard in the praise. This is permissible for the women. This is permissible if the woman that the man got married to is a virgin she's a virgin then he remains with her for seven days the sunnah is seven days is hers some people have misunderstood those seven days they don't go to the masjid and they don't pray jama'at jama'at no khutbah no nothing he's at home he's like why are you at home well didn't the prophet say you have to stay with the wife for seven days at home I've seen this. It means that these are her seven days. Meaning if you're married to more than one wife, this one gets seven days. She's a virgin. But if she's not a virgin, then he stays with her for... Huh? He stays with her for three. He stays with her for three. The man has to remember that his piety and how noble you are is based upon how you are to your partners, your spouse. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, خيركم, خيركم The best amongst you is the best for his family. A man, when he comes home, the children's face change. Oh, why are you here? The wife doesn't want to see even the cats. They hide from you. You come into the house, everyone is like, oh man, it's him again. They wish you don't come. It's not someone who's good. Your own children, your own wife, partners, your spouse your, does not like you. They find your presence with them a trouble. 
you're a troublesome person, harsh in your speech, and you're not good to your partners, then remember, you're not the best amongst the ummah. The best person is the best to his family. وَأَنَا, the Prophet said, وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي And I am the best for my family. The man is determined by what his wife knows of him. And the wife, she's determined by what her husband knows about her. You two are the closest people. And that's why Allah referred to both of you for one another. What? Allah referred to the partners. هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنَّ Clothes. What does the clothes do? Clothes do? It, it prevents people from seeing your private parts. Your aura. No one can see your default. The aura is, if we were all walking naked, it would not look good. It's to cover your, huh? your body parts. The wife, that's what she's doing for her husband. Those places that people cut, she's covering it. And the same is with the what? The husband with his wife. And that's why the partners don't speak about each other. They don't talk about each other's defaults and problems. Because you're a clothing for your husband. Why are you talking about your husband to other people for? Sister, your, your wife, you're her clothing. Why are, you talking to her? why are you talking about her to other people, her flaws and her mistakes? Never. One of the things I learned was, through seeing people's issues, is some people they will go when they have a conflict and I'm going to speak about that inshallah ta'ala when I call it, speak about the khilafat zawjiya they have a conflict and they have a problem and which marriage doesn't have a conflict every marriage does but brothers and sisters when you have a khilaf you both need to learn how to fix it and how do you learn how to fix it I'm going to speak about it in more details later is you both of you have a premise and that premise is we were both raised and we came from two different households our observation and the way that we see things is what is different there is going to be that difference and a lot of the times if you look at conflicts between partners it's not based upon an ayah that one is going against or a hadith that the other one is going against you tend to find it is just Difference of upbringing. The cup is half full and the cup is half empty. Well, it's both, right? It's how you look at it. It's perception. First of all, you have to know that. Are we all together? My mother raised me like this. Your mother raised you like that. I don't want to impose on you the way I was raised, necessarily. Because if I try to impose those things onto you, then you will turn out to be who? Me. And then that, I'm actually in love of with who? I'm in love with myself, not her for who she is. So those things, brothers, leave it and let it be the way it is. You shouldn't try to change it. Let her have those, and she should let you have those which she may not necessarily agree on. The things that both of you need to change are the things that play a role in the marriage. They're vital. They are strong. They are serious issues. You both have to work on that. And, or it has a religious evidence for it. These are the issues that we both need to adapt to. Are we all together? So it's important that we understand that. The Muslim brothers, even when he has differences with his spouse, you will always find his akhlaq and his manners and his etiquettes don't go out of the window. Some men, when they get angry, they use words for their wife, despicable terms. And then when he calms down, he says, I'm sorry, Wallahi, I was angry. The Muslim doesn't lose his, however angry you became, you can never see, say these terms. It can never come out of the mouth of a Muslim. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا The Muslim who has the completest iman is أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا The one whose etiquette is the completest. Allahu Akbar. وَخِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ And the best amongst you is the one who is best to his wife. Best to his wife. The Prophet told us, Alaihi Wasallam, in another hadith, 
لا يفرك مؤمن مؤمنة إن كره منها خلقا رضي منها آخر A man if he looks at his wife there are things that you're not going to like about she, what she does but wallahi look at the ocean of good that she has one thing my father used to say is if you've known a person for a long time and you end up mentioning three or four or four flaws of this person you've just proven to me that they are a human being but 10 years you've got four mistakes 10 years of a marriage and all you can bring up is four or five things that have happened between you two that actually proves to me that your wife is amazing Allah are we all together the poet he said who on this earth are you going to be pleased with everything that they say or do 100% no one but virtue is that this person's mistakes can be counted some people subhanallah you're like where should I start from their good can be counted but their evil is so much billah. that's a different situation but we're talking about someone you have one or two three or four or five mistakes which is gonna happen are we all together my mom used to say the teeth and your tongue are the two closest and sometimes you're gonna you're gonna bite yourself. Does not that happen sometimes? You bite yourself. But your teeth doesn't leave, nor does your tongue. They still stay together, they work it out. They might have a conversation between them too. Allah Alam. But the point is, this happens. The two closest people are gonna have conflicts. It's gonna happen. It's bound to happen. But the believer, wallahi, he is a teacher for his wife at the times of conflict as he is at the times of what? ease remember what remember your position when you have a khilaf you're a teacher still you're teaching your wife how to hold yourself together she's learning from you she's looking at you Allah is very important and words that you say it's hard for you to take it back I promise you especially women they never forget it they will remember that and they will store it in their long-term memory and it will come out every now and then to remind you uh, they'll remind you aren't you the one who said <laughs> yeah so don't make it too much hold on to your tongue hold on to your what on to your tongue when you call these itisalat or companies like that what do they say to you anything you say or do will be will be recorded ha that's marriage everything you say the wife is recording it she's remembering it make sure that you know what you said because words are hard to take back words are hard to be taken back the prophet ﷺ, in hajjat al wada the final sermon the biggest largest congregation that the prophet ever got Never, never has he got this congregation before or after. Biggest. 120,000 companions are standing in front of him. Salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi. And guess what he said? He said, Allah was tawsu bin nisa'i khaira. The women. The women. He's got the biggest congregation. Largest number. You have to remember the Arab Arabian, Arabian Peninsula and the way that the people were. Women had no value. No one cared about the women. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to the men, instructed the men, he said to them, I advise you to treat women well. The Prophet said this, I advise you to treat women well. Allahu Akbar. And then people have the audacity to say what? That Islam subjugates women and we're here to liberate women. Wallahi, he did. And look what he said to the men. He said, فَإِنَّهُنَّ عَوَانٌ He said that the women, the women are like prisoners under your authority. She left her family. She left her dad. She left her brothers, her mother, her house. She left everything. 
She's right there under you. She's right under you. She's a captive. She's like a prisoner for you. Not that she is a prisoner. She's like it, the way she's under you. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, You have no right over them other than that which the Quran and the Sunnah have given you. Those are the rights that you have over them. The Messenger وسلم, he then carried on saying, You have rights over your wives as well. And your wives have rights over you. The rights that you have over your wives is that they do not bring to your beds those you dislike. I mean, they don't bring to your house people you don't want. Then the Prophet said, The rights that they have on you is that you provide for them clothing. And the food that they eat You give them food And you give them clothing She's still not wearing The clothing that she married you with Every now and then you're going out Buying new thobes or, huh? You're buying new clothing And she's still wearing huh? The clothing that she brought from her father's house It's something you need to remember You give her food If the man As we're going to mention soon is married to more than one wife he should be just fairness the prophet said man kanat lahu imra'atani anyone who has two wives yamilu ila ahad ahaduhuma ala al-ukhra and he, he leans towards one over the other ja'a yawm al-qiyamati that man will come the day of judgment wa ahadu shaqayhi saqitun that man will come the day of judgment and he will be paralyzed from one of his sides. Paralyzed from one side. He will come the day of judgment. Part of his body will be hanging down. The Prophet Allah said in the ayah, Allah said, You will never be able to do perfect justice between your wives. You will never be able to. What does it mean you'll never be able to be? Perfectly just between your wives It means That without a doubt The man is going to have love towards one wife over the other It's going to happen But that doesn't show in his actions That does not show in his what? It doesn't show that in his action Whatever you believe it's in your heart That is not something you can control The way you feel Like in the way you act Upon the way you feel Is what you're going to be held account to So you can't be 50-50 between your wife in your heart maybe then don't make it on your actions your actions make sure it's fair 50-50 and there could be situations where the man he loves both of his wife the same it's possible it is possible it is the Prophet ﷺ was known that he loved who? the most that he loved Aisha most he was asked, Ayyun nasi ahabbu ilayka, which person is most beloved to you? Qala Aisha to, he said Aisha. Qultu minad rijali from the men? Qala abuha her father. Qultu, I then asked, he said, Amr ibn As, men, who after that? Qala thumma Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Prophet mentioned that. How many, now we're going to move on to the fourth point. How many women can a free man marry? How many women is the man allowed to marry? The man is allowed to marry four women He's allowed to in the Sharia It is permissible for the man to marry four women Okay And As is common amongst many women They believe he can only marry a second woman If there's a legal reason No There doesn't have to be a legal reason a man can marry a second wife even if there's no reason for him to marry a second wife. The second thing, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble. The man doesn't have to inform his first wife if he wants to marry a second wife. There's no need, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Would I encourage him to do that? No. I would say, tell your first wife. Be a man about it. If you want to do it, why hide it? 
The fact that you're hiding it shows there's a weakness. That's my opinion. But if he chooses to be weak and he doesn't want to inform his first wife, that is permissible. Another third is, so the first reason some people believe he can only marry a second wife if his first wife is not able to have children or if there's a problem between him, then he can only marry a second wife. That's incorrect. So I responded. The second thing that's incorrect as well, that he has to inform his first wife when he wants to get married, who he wants to get married to, and she has to be part of the process. No, it's not true. The third thing that's incorrect is, the woman he wants to marry, she has to have a problem, and he has to marry her to save the day. It's also, it's also, it's also incorrect. This is something permissible. It's allowed. He can only not marry another wife if he doesn't have the ability. If he doesn't have the ability, whether it be the financial ability, whether it be the physical ability, he doesn't have any of those two. Either he doesn't have this or that, he is not allowed to marry another woman. Because of the ayah, Allah wa Taala commanded us to be what? To give these women their rights. So you're lacking the rights of the woman. So you don't have money, don't get married. To another woman. Or, you're physically unable to. You're not allowed to get married. It is impermissible. And subhanallah, I have to point this out. Some women, they go as going overboard by insulting and name calling and belittling this concept of a ta'addud marry more than one wife and sometimes some people the way that they speak about it it is what it can become disbelief of Allah Azza wa Jalla and his messenger it can reach kufr the way that they speak about it are we all together it is dangerous this is a hukum of Allah no government no institution can Prohibit a man from marrying more than one wife. This is a hukum Allah permitted. No country can say you're only allowed to marry one wife. Are we all together, brothers? No constitution. Can't. Because it's something Allah permitted it for him. But if the wife and the husband they have a mutual agreement and they agree before marriage that I won't marry more than one wife, then it's permissible. And if he makes that agreement, he should go by it. He made a promise. He made a promise. He needs to stick by the promise that he made. And sometimes, subhanAllah, the concept of polygamy can be a solution for many of the problems. In countries where, I remember one time, I was working somewhere, two women came in. I was shocked. Two women came in, one woman was talking to the other woman, he's like, she was saying to her that your daughter, your daughter, her husband, he's found cheating on her, meaning do zina and haram. That's what this woman said to you, the other woman. I overheard it. And so the other one responded, she said, at least my daughter, her husband didn't marry another wife. Her husband is doing zina and she's saying but at least my hus- my daughter's husband didn't go and get married to another wife that's when i became shocked are we all together to be very honest with you a lot of the times you find polygamy could be good in a society or a community it could be good and it could be something nice but you know what makes it bad and destroys the polygamy concept is the people around it they will go to the sister. How did you let this happen? Wallahi, I would never have done it. I would never have let this happen. Ah. I don't know how you allow this to happen. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy for you, sister. Ah. May Allah allow you to be strong at a calamity like this. Subhanallah. It's sad that it, concern, it does not concern you. It's none of your business. 
Oh, today, is your husband going to come? Oh, I forgot, he's married to another wife. Things like that, they throw indirect. Always reminding the white woman. And if you ponder, you realize this is where the problem comes from. It's actually not an issue that's happening between the what? The husband and his wife. Or with his other wife. It's a lot of the time, the community. And another time. Other sisters who are married would look at that sister as the one who's in the second wife. <laughs> the second wife. They would look at her as what? Get away from her. Don't talk to her. So the second, the one, the second wife, she feels looked down at. Why did she feel looked down at? Because she, got, she went into polygamy. I'm not making this up. It's true. It's a reality. Sisters who are who are married are going to say that. And a lot of the times, the reason why women would make sure that they don't allow polygamy practiced around their area is because they want to teach their husband a, a lesson. They want to say, hey, look at that. Look at that man. He's wearing two different shoes. Uh, do you know why he's wearing two different shoes? It's because he married more than one wife. I'm telling you, be careful. This is going to be a problem for you. So they have to destroy everything around them. Ala kulli hal. Everyone needs to know Allah is looking over them. Are we all together? I remember one brother, he told me, he said that I suffered from being with the community. No brother wants to give me salams. I said, why? He said, because I have four wives. I said, oh, it makes sense. It makes sense why no one wants to give you salams. Because nobody wants to get in trouble. Nobody wants to get in trouble. Because if, if people walk with him and become friends with him, his wife's going to, who are you friends with? No, 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 don't hang around with him. Uh, he's going to brainwash you. Uh, he's going to start whispering to you. Anyways, the point is, four wives are permissible for the man. But I don't believe it's a sunnah. It's not a sunnah. Polygamy is not a sunnah. It's mubah. It's permissible, as I said. It's what? It's permissible. Just like it's eating is permissible. And drinking is permissible. Polygamy is not a sunnah. It's norms, combing your hair, showering. It was the Arab culture that they did this, and our religion permitted it, and restricted it to how much? Four. That's it. Before Islam, it was tons and tons of women they would marry. And Islam just came and restricted it to four. ibn Salama, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he was married to ten women. Ten women. And the Prophet said, Amsik arba'an wa fariq sa'iruhunna. Take four from them. From those ten women that you have, choose four from them and get rid of the rest. Ah, so you have to go and choose from those ten, four. Pay attention here. What does this hadith show us? That if a person comes into Islam and is already married, they don't have to do a new marriage. They don't have to do a new marriage. The wife and the husband, if they were Christians and they were married in Christianity, they come into Islam, they don't have to do a new nikah. They just stay together. Because what did the Prophet say? He said, choose four from them, as though the previous marriage was considered. Also, Qais ibn Harithin, he had eight women with him, and the Prophet ﷺ, he said, اختر منهن أربعان. Choose four from them. Choose four. Now we're going to go into al muharramat min al-nisa. Women that are, one is prohibited to wed. Women that are haram for a man to wed. The prohibited women to marry are two types. They are how many types? Two types. Tahrimun mu'abbadun. The first one is permanently prohibited. They are permanently prohibited from you. You can never ever marry them, these women. Every time. The second one is tahrimun mu'aqatun, temporary, temporarily prohibited. It's a temporary prohibition. Let's go back to the first one, which is the 
permanent one. The permanent one are three. They are what? There are three types. Those are who are prohibited from you permanently due to blood relation and nasab. Due to what? Blood relation. And that's like that's like Al Banat, your daughters, your sisters, your maternal and your paternal aunties, your uh, mothers, your your brothers, daughters, all of them are and nasab, blood relation. Always haram. Never ever marry them. Always prohibitive. The second of the what? The mu'abbad. The permanent prohibition is al-musahara. Al-musahara is due to marriages. Due, Due to marriage. These are prohibited from you permanently due to marriage. Like your wife's mother. Your wife's mother. Or your wife's daughter. She's not your daughter, but you married a woman who had a daughter from another marriage. Are we all together? Um, you can't marry her daughter ever, ever, never, ever. Number three is arrabau, breastfeeding. Those that are prohibited from you due to due to best breastfeeding. Due to breastfeed, breastfeeding, breastfed. And that's the one who the mother breastfed you and this child together. She's not your sister, but this child was either fostered and the mother breastfed. She what? She best breastfed. Is it every type of breastfeeding? Or is a particular type of breastfeeding that brings us to the sixth point, inshallah ta'ala, which is tahrim. Now, my mother breastfed me, and then she came and she breastfed another girl. That's not my sister. She fostered this child, my mother, or she adopted the child, she breastfed the child. She's a girl. Okay? She's my what? My sister? From what? Uqtman al She's my sister from what? From breastfeeding. Okay. The condition for that breastfeeding is it has to be two years. It has to be for two years. For two years. As the ayah says, Well, well, that you're doing now, Lada, who The two years here means before the child reaches two. Huh? I'm coming to that now. Second thing is, it has to be khamsi ma'lumatin to breastfeeding. Uh, five, sorry, five, five. It used to be ten, it was abrogated to five. Remember, breastfeeding here means the child suckles on the mother's breast. Not that she puts it somewhere and then he drinks it from there. No. Breastfeeding. She takes the child, she breastfeeds the child. Uh. Ha, five times. And those five, it has to be that fills the child. It has to be like, he has it. There's another mas'ala, I don't want to go into it right now. It's a controversial issue, which is, this is rada'at, rada'atul kabir. Breastfeeding the senior person, an old person. Uh, there's a mas'ala that scholars talk about. That the Prophet ﷺ commanded 
a particular woman to go and breastfeed a, a man and she said, Ya Rasulullah, he has a bed. The Prophet said, breastfeed him. And the hadith is sahih, but we'll leave that for another time. And the discussion related to that. <laughs> but the one we're talking about here, and what we're arguing here is what? The baby. Before two years, it has to be five. That's it. Now we're going to move on to the second type of prohibited women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on this opinion that we're speaking about now, after two years, no. So about before two years. Okay? When the child only lives on milk. This is the only time that they, these scholars are referring to. Let's go on to the second point, which is Al Muharramati Mu'akatan. The women that are prohibited from you temporarily. Temporarily. And that is Al Jam'u Bayn Al Ukhtain. You're married to one sister. You can't marry her other sister whilst you're married to the sister. But the minute you divorce this one, you can go and marry this one. Are we all together? That's, the prohibition is only at the time you're married to her sister. Are we all together, brothers? You can't marry two sisters at the same time. Because of the ayah, أَنْ تَجْمَعُ بَيْنَ الْأُخْتَيْنِ إِلَّا مَا إِلَّا مَا قَدِ السَّلَفِ Or you can't marry a girl and her maternal or her paternal auntie. You can't. It's haram. لا يجمع بين المرأة وعمتها ولا بين المرأة وخالتها. You can't. Also, another man's wife you can't marry. But she's married right now. But her prohibition is muakkat. It's only time while she's married. Or you can't marry a woman who's on her idda. She's in her. Idda, meaning her three cycles. It has, you can't marry her temporarily for this time. Now we're going to go into Al Ankihatul Fasida. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, 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 I need to go back. The third, the fourth type of woman that you can't marry temporarily is Al Mutalakatu Thalatan, a woman that you've divorced her three. A woman that you've divorced three. You said talaktu, talaktu, talaktu ki. All three times. Are we all together? You can't temporarily marry her until she goes and marries another man. This is the temporary year, the fourth one. Or the fifth one. The next one is Zawaju Zaniya, a woman who's, do, who's done zina. Unless they both repent. A woman committed zina with a man, they can't marry each other unless they repent. Because Allah said, When I say both of them, I mean that the man committed zina, okay, and the woman committed the zina, either, either, any one of them, not, no one can marry them unless they repent from what they did. Unless they repent from what they did. Those are the five temporary, temporary women that you can't marry. Now let's go into the Al Ankihatul Fasida, the void marriages. The void marriages. The void marriages are, inshallah ta'ala, three. They're null and void, baseless. The first one is called Nikahu Shigar. Nikahu Ashigar. What does Nikahu Shigar mean? It means a man marries either his daughter or his sister or a woman he is a guardian over to another man with the intention that he's going to swap with him. They both want to swap with each other. He'll say, You know what? Give me your daughter and I'll give you my daughter. Marry your daughter off to me and I'll marry my. And they do that. Null and void. It is. It's null and void. The Prophet prohibited that type of nikah. Based on the hadith in Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim, and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anaha anish shigari. The Prophet prohibited that one. And it generally happens with the elderly men. Very old. They want to get married. They can't. They go to another guy. I got a daughter. You got a daughter, huh? Let's sort something out. No, it's not allowed. 
And the Prophet explained that that's what it means in the hadith. He said, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Sorry, Abu Huraira explained it. He said, Washigaru an yakula rajuli rajuli zawijni bnataka wa uzawiju kabnati o zawijni uhtaka wa uzawiju ka uhti. They swap. I will give you my daughter, you give me your daughter, or I'll give you my sister, you give me your sister, and they swap. It's not permissible, it's null and void. The second one is, so that nikah is baseless. Nothing is happening here. The second one is, nikahul muhallil. The nikahul muhallil. Nikahul muhallil is what? It is a man who finished his divorce. He finished his divorce. All of it. Bam, bam, bam. He divorced a woman. And then he, he's like, oh no, I want to take my wife back. Okay, I want to take my wife back. So he goes to a brother, he says, look, actually, I can't get married to my wife again because I finished everything. Can you get married to her and divorce her so I can get married to her? And that happens. It's actually, a, they made it into a service in the UK that there are men who are charging. They charge a price, an amount to do this. It's a service. Haq. Wallahi, it's a service. And it's the youth. What kind of aql do you have? Subhanallah. Are you with me? To tell somebody, marry my wife, and then I'll get, take my wife back. In the beginning, watch what you say when you're divorcing your wife. And if it does happen, and you divorced, let it be natural. If she gets married to another man and she comes back, it just happens. But you endorsing, please marry my wife. It shows something is sick in this person. This is called Nikahul Muhallil. Guess what? That man who got married to this woman, he goes, Okay, how much are you going to give me? It's a service in the UK. I told you it's a service. He charges. He says, Okay, give me a thousand. Give me a thousand. Maybe it's not a thousand, but he'll say, He'll mention a price this much. He says, Okay. You give him the money. He takes the money, he gets married to his sister, and then he divorces her. This muhallil who did it, what he did is no, there's no nikah. So if she goes back to the first man, there's nothing that happened. She's going back again to zina. Nothing took place here. Because this nikah is void. Are we all together? It's void. It has no base. It has no base. لَعَنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Messenger prohibit الْمُحَلِّلَ وَالْمُحَلِّلَ لَهِ The Prophet cursed the one who does it and the one who is asking it to be done for him. Both of them are cursed on the tongue of the Prophet Ah, The Prophet said that Now keep in mind there are there are things that need to be kept in mind. Why is the muhallil prohibited? He's saying to him, go marry my wife so I can go back to her. And this man is okay, I'll do that for that. Are we all together? Are you with me, brothers? But it's, and that nikah is null and void. If she goes back to her previous husband, nothing is considered. But if the woman has a thought in her mind, without him saying anything to her, she says, you know what? I want to go back to my old husband. And I know I can't. I'm going to get married. And I'm going to leave that brother. This is not called muhallil. So she gets married. The brother doesn't know. She's got her thought in her mind. She gets married and she leaves after a, a period of time. And she comes back to her hus old husband. The old husband doesn't know what's happening. The new one that's getting married doesn't also know what's taking place. It's something that's in her mind. She did it on her own accord. This doesn't fall under the concept of al-muhallil. Are we all together? Does that make sense? It doesn't fall under it. But it falls under another point that I'm going to come to later, inshaAllah ta'ala. Does that make sense? It is different. Well, Idaq Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah, he wrote a kitab called Bayanu al-Dalil fi Butlan al-Tahlil. He wrote a thick volume on this issue. The third type of marriage that's void. Are we all together? That is void. Is nikahul mut'ah contract marriage? Nikahul mut'ah, the contract marriage. This one's also null and 
null and void. What does this mean? It means that the man and the woman, they agree for one month they're going to be together. And they say for that one month or that one year, we're just going to play hide and seek. And that's just a marriage of pleasure. It's a temporary marriage. They sign it and they do it and they agree and the well hakada. Now people call it temporary marriage. Others call it disconnected marriage. Whatever, the, whatever name they call it, it's haram. It is pre- null and void. And if they do it, there's nothing that's happened. They're committing zina. They're committing. They're committing zina. No. They're gonna come to misyara. Just since you mentioned it, there's another one called al-misyar. Sah? Have you heard of it? Al-misyar is normal marriage. The girl gets married, her father knows, her family knows. Everyone knows. It's an official. Not everyone knows, but she tells her father. There are two witnesses. Okay? The man is with the woman. But what the woman says is, I don't want anything from you. I don't want money from you. I don't need anything from you. I have no... I don't want you to come to my house. I don't want my children seeing you. She's married, she's divorced, for example. I don't want my children seeing you. I will tell you when I want you to come, and I'll tell you when I want you to leave. He says, okay, I promise, I agree. This is permissible. This is permissible. And this is the evidence of Sauda binti Zama. Sauda gave up all her nights. To who? Aisha. She said, Aisha, take my night. So the Prophet never used to go to Soda bin Tizama because she grew very old. Soda. So the woman is allowed to give her rights up. Are we all together? And she says, in some situations, she might say, My previous husband, if he finds out that I'm married, I might have a big problem due to my kids. He may not provide for my kids. I might have a big issue. So, no. It's permissible. It is permissible. But a lot of the times, it causes issues. Another one I want to talk about, which is called Azawaju Biniyat al Talaq. Azawaju Biniyat al Talaq. A man, he's a student of knowledge. He's a student of knowledge. He's in the University of Medina or he's studying in somewhere. And he says, You know what? I'm not with my family. I'm here by myself. I'm going to get married for one year. Okay? Then he goes and he marries a woman with the thought of what? After one year he wants to divorce her. He doesn't tell anyone this. He doesn't write it down as a contract between her and him. He doesn't say anything. It's only a thought that's in his mind. He's keeping it to himself. Are we all together? And then after a year he divorces her. He leaves and he just divorces her. There are number of scholars who believe the permissibility of this because they say this is not mut'ah I'm going to speak and opposite the, the woman can do that the woman same with the woman the woman does it she wants to get married and wahakada. there are many 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 scholars who believe the permissibility regarding it rather some scholars they transmitted a consensus that is permissible all the conditions of marriage have been met there's no mut'ah here because he never told her number two they say that the two witnesses are here they say that the guardian was informed. They say it was announced and it was made public. And from the scholars who believe the permissibility is Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. Sheikh ibn Uthaymin said it's permissible, there's nothing wrong with it. And over 30 Imams of the Salaf believe it's permissible. Like, and I am not content with that view. That view does not. It does not, it's not pleasing to me in any way, shape or form. And I'll tell you why. If our messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he came into the market. The messenger came into the market. And when he came into the market, he placed his hand inside a set of grains. He came to a man, he saw him selling. The Prophet put his hand inside the grain. And then it, the Prophet's fingers came into contact with the moist. And then the messenger said to the man, why don't you bring this to the surface? Why are you hiding it for? And then the man said, okay, oh messenger, I'll I'll do that. 
the messenger then said to him, Man rashana falaysa minna. Anyone who deceives us is not from amongst us. Subratu ta'am, just the food. Imagine the honor of a woman. You fooled her father. You shaked his hand and you said to him, Imsaakum bi ma'roofin, aw tasrihum bi ihsan. I'm going to look after your daughter in good, in prosperity. This she's mine. Her responsibility is mine. I will take care of her. Hand her over to me. And she's a virgin. Never been married, method and before. Or even if she's not a virgin, it's besides the point. And you took her in your head all this time. You're like, after you, I'm going to divorce you. That's the greatest form of deception. Or one of the greatest form of deception. It's khiyana. And our religion doesn't promote khiyana. Doesn't allow that. Are we all together? And this cause, this act causes fitan and fasad. Mallahu bi alim. Only Allah knows. Are you with me, brothers? Especially if the person who does this is a person whose knowledge is attributed to him, or he's seen as a person of ilm, and he does this, it becomes distasteful amongst the people. Are we all together, brothers? And so, so many people are practicing this, and they're destroying the image of the deen, especially in the land of the non-Muslims. Are we all together, brothers? So, it's something I strongly discourage. حَتَّى وَإِنْ قَالَ بِهِ بِنُ عُثَيْمِينَ وَإِنْ قَالَ هُمْ مُحَمَّدْ مُحَمَّدْ إِدْرِيسَ الشَّافِعِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ and others this view is very very weak yeah, صحيح. it really does it really does it goes against the concept of every action is based upon its intention there are many ways to discuss this issue it's something that one should avoid and stay away from and leave it and not do that like no sister should do that to any brother and no brother should do that to a sister. No one should do that. Shall we stop there, inshallah ta'ala? And we can do the rest for next week. We'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan. And Allah and his messenger are free from it.